Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is John Sheridan. I'm the Digital Director at the National Archives. I'm going to talk to you about legislation as data. Um, to convince you right up front, here is um, the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 encoded in the legal document markup language. Um, it's a format called a coma and toso. Now, when we think about the law, legislation, and data, there's a few basic ideas it's important to understand. The law is both legislation and the common law, case law. And what legislation does, a piece of legislation changes the law from one state to a new state. Now, when we are representing a piece of legislation as data, we're not modeling the whole of the law. That would be really, really hard. What we're doing is modeling the document, in particular the parts of the document that we care about that help convey legal meaning, and we're modeling parts of the document that we care about in terms of the law. So for us particularly, information about amendments. We use a tree-like structure in XML for the documents, and we use a graph-like structure for modeling all of the amendments. Now, what glues all of our data together is quite a sophisticated scheme using URLs. Um, and that allows us to link and connect the documents as they're changing over time and as they apply to different parts of the UK in different ways with data about what parts of the law are doing, particularly data about amendments. And the URL scheme for legislation at gov.uk um, is kind of a symphony to the power of URLs um, for allowing you to bring together document-oriented information and data. Now, where this really comes into its own is when you're dealing with the kind of challenge that we've been dealing with um, in relation to some, to some of our responsibilities under the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. Now, very briefly, this repeals European Communities Act 1972, and it's like turning the power off to a whole body of law. So what the Act does is it deals with the consequences of repealing the 1972 Act by incorporating law that currently directly applies to the UK into the UK domestic statute book. So regulations like the General Data Protection Regulation become incorporated as domestic law under this Act. Now, we um, have been given a job to do under this Act, which is to make available to the public the legislation that's being incorporated into the domestic statute book. Now, we've been working to support government departments because we have a bunch of tools for managing legislation, fulfilling our duty under that Act, and aiding legal certainty as the UK leaves the EU. And we've launched two services, a large archive of European law, which is like a static collection um, taken from the Eurlex website, the European Commission's website. And we've been adding European legislation to legislation.gov.uk. Now, um, it looks easy. In practice, taking this body of European legislation and domesticating it is quite a big data transformation job. Um, Thankfully, there's a lot of data that's on the ULX website. There's data both about the documents, a lot of classification metadata, and a lot of amendment data that we can use as a source. But it's not always obvious when you're working with somebody else's data what you need to choose. So our Withdrawal Act talks about EU decisions. What's a decision? You have to really understand the data. And the documents are modelled in a different way from how we model UK legislation documents. So we've had to transform the documents from the European data model into the UK data model so that we can then apply the amendments that the UK is making to produce the UK applicable versions of this newly incorporated legislation. So a big data transformation job. Now... In doing that, and you can see all of this on the legislation.gov.uk website, if you go to browse and then legislation originating from the EU, you see that we're able to add quite a lot of value in terms of how the legislation is presented um, by 
translating it into our model. So here is GDPR, um, and you can see that we have a table of contents, not a thing that you find on ULX. We've also, um, this is Article 2, we've also brought together um, the amendments that the UK has made, or is proposing to make for exit day, with the text that's being modified, and a timeline that's showing people, as far as we know, what we expect to happen. Um, so here at GDPR, we run into EU exit day on the 31st of the 10th, 2019. So this is bringing together EU documents, UK documents, EU data about amendments, and UK data about amendments into a single platform. Now, having all this data about amendments means we can do some quite interesting analysis um, on the impact of EU exit on our own domestic statute book. So here you can see the drop in the number of amendments to UK primary legislation and the increase in amendments to UK secondary legislation. If you look at what we're doing with amendments to EU legislation, this red line is the EU amending EU legislation and the hockey stick diagram is the number of amendments that the UK's EU exit SIs are making to that incorporated body of EU law. Um, here's a glimpse at who's doing the work. So um, DEFRA and HMT have been very busy. Um, and here's a glimpse at what the pattern of amendments are. So is it that we, there's like a one-to-one -one relationship on the whole, one UK piece of legislation amending one EU piece of legislation? In terms of amending our own domestic legislation, then again, we can see that the amendments made for EU exit are largely for these red bars. These are statutory instruments, recent statutory instruments. The blue bars are UK primary legislation. So again, having all of this amendment information means that we can see a lot about the pattern of how the UK is changing its statute book for EU exit. Now, we're preparing for multiple scenarios at the moment. Um, uh, we're currently syncing both documents and amendment data from ULX every day onto legislation.gov.uk. And we've built what I can only describe as a data clutch between these two data sets of law, UK law and EU law, so that in the case that there is a no deal exit, we can disengage the clutch and apply the UK amendments and produce UK applicable texts. In the case of a deal, we can flexibly shift gear and synchronize where we need to continue synchronizing. So imagine goods for Northern Ireland, legislation around that we can synchronize um, and disengage where we don't need to synchronize. Um, it's quite a sophisticated mechanism, but we are ready for whatever comes our way this month. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. Lots of questions, I'm sure, in the audience. Let's go with this first one to, to kick us off. Hi, yes, uh, Joe Dulger, Data Protection Officer, University of Winchester. Particularly interested in one of your last comments um, in terms of the uh, Boris Johnson's proposals today in terms of Northern Ireland, etc. Could you talk a little bit more in terms of how the National Archives would handle that in terms of um, if a part of the UK uh, had to be different for whatever reason? Okay, thank you. So we're really fortunate that we've built a model for the complexity of um, the UK as it is with its primary and secondary legislation. So we've got three different legal systems with four different jurisdictions and a statute book that everyone's modifying in different ways. So we already have a really good model for dealing with legal jurisdictional extent. So where the text a single text may be um, amended in different ways for Northern Ireland, Scotland, England, and Wales. Um, so that's already in our core model. By bringing the European legislation into that model, um, we can then allow it to be, um, essentially, the model will support it being fragmented um, in line with um, however the parliaments, assemblies, and governments of the UK choose to amend it. Great. Basically, just treating it like UK primary legislation, and it's already a problem solved. Excellent. 
More questions? Uh, Sui Lang Harris from the Legal Education Foundation. Um, we've heard a lot of talk about the work that the government had to do to uh, make all of the necessary SIs for Brexit and just curious about how uh, the system that you have created has been coping with the peaks and troughs of SIs coming through and, and the associated amendments they're making to retain DU law. Thank you. And right at the back there. Yeah, um, it's sort of uh, the graphs you showed were really interesting. I think it's really the really interesting bit for me as an analyst is that sort of piece around what's, what's amending what and how is it all changing. Um, I saw a presentation a few years back by um, somebody from GitHub uh, who had been doing some work with the French government and they basically created essentially a GitHub style approach to demonstrating how the, the, the law had been written and amended so you could see all the amendments as sort of separate commits and things and I was just wondering sort of having engaged with legislation.gov.uk occasionally whether there was anything about the way in which you could present it more as an educational piece rather than, as well as being a legal reference uh, to sort of help people like the public navigate sort of what's been going on what is changing really. Okay thank you. So to the first question um, we had to make a lot of adaptations to our um, tools that are used for drafting legislation because for the first time we see UK statutory instruments modifying EU legislation and those documents have a very different structure so if you're changing something that's got a different structure you now need to support those structures in your drafting tools and in your data models so we had to figure out what all of that needed to look like adapt the tools and get it into the hands of um, SI drafters in time and we then had to stress test our publishing system and um, particularly because we're responsible for registering statutory instruments and um, that puts us between making and laying in the process for SIs um, needing to make sure that we could do that um, really quickly um, so that um, we could support government departments when they were um, under pressure to get their legislation through um, and um, we made sure that we had a capability to deal with um, eye-watering peaks um, in the event none of my worst case scenarios have have come to fruition in terms of either the number of amendments or the numbers of pieces of legislation we were planning for and could have coped with um, quite a lot more than what we've seen. Um, to the question about um, GitHub um, and education, um, so I think that UK legislation is way more complicated than what you can manage using a simple, simple version control through something like GitHub. Um, uh, commencement in particular is um, incredibly difficult, um, or can be, um, in terms of uh, what's brought into force, where, when, for what purpose, and all of those things can be varied. Um, and we've had to do a lot of work in our models to deal with that kind of complexity. In terms of aiding um, users, we know that one of the big challenges with presenting legislation is that many people who are working with the service, and we see up to 100,000 users a day on legislation.uk, so there's a lot of people looking at this content, um, is that they, many of them lack the mental model to be able to work with legislation. Um, we've got plans underway to try and present the content in a way that helps fill out the elements of the mental model that the user might lack um, so that we can help people better perhaps understand um, the law that they're looking at um, and what it means and what its status is. Um, the timelines in particular and especially in the context of EU exit and especially if things get complicated with a transition and with different things happening in different parts of the UK are going to be really key and we've done quite a lot of work on how we develop those timelines um, to give clear messaging about how the law is changing over time for different parts of the country and those some of those things have tested really well with users um, and it'll be interesting what you'll be looking at on legislation at gov.uk come November. We've got time for a few more very quick ones, a gentleman there, a lady there and the gentleman there. Got one minute and 48 uh, Aaron seconds. Aaron Nelson from BDB Pittman's occasional drafter of legislation. I'd be interested to just pick up on a point you made about um, uh, 
The idea of putting your tools in the hands of statutory instrument drafters during the course of production of the instrument, can you talk a bit more about that? Because I'd be interested to know how that works um, in terms of the ability to automate, if that's what you're talking about, the drafting process in some way. So we've got the lady there. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Kira, Ministry of Justice. Um, I was just hoping you could say a little more about how you treat the devolved SI specifically and how you can sort of flag and treat some of the legislation that's devolved versus not. You've mentioned a few times the different systems in the UK. Thank you. And the gentleman to two rows back there. Stephen Chaniassi, about to be an ex-civil servant. Um, you've built a lovely engine for ingesting the products of legislative machines. Given that you've got a gearbox, can it go into reverse? and help the generation of superior legislation. Thank you. Drafting tools, big conversation. Let's talk about that over drinks. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'm gonna, it's a huge topic. Um, lots of different drafting tools. We're developing a new drafting tool in partnership with UK Parliament, Scottish Parliament, um, Parliamentary Council and the Scottish Government at the moment. Um, big topic. Uh, for um, devolved legislation, there are two things that we do. Um, there's um, different types of legislation that are made by the devolved administration, so Scottish statutory instruments, and they essentially are part of a separate series. Um, and similarly, Welsh statutory instruments will be labelled with a W, um, and they'll have their own numbering series. Um, so you can find, if you like, the amending legislation by its type. Um, the part that is more sophisticated is we record the legal jurisdictional extent of every part of the document. Um, and that's one of the features on um, legislation.gov.uk. So if I go back here, show geographical extent. And that's already baked in for the UK version of GDPR um, and for all of the other legislation that we've incorporated. Um, so this extent model allows the legislation to be varied for different parts of the UK, even at the level of an article of a regulation. Um, and that's one of the kind of core features in our model. Um, and it's actually provided for in the URI scheme. So um, if you want to reference the UK version of GDPR on the 1st of January 2020, as it extends to England and Wales, there is already a URL for that, even though we don't know what that text will say right now. Um, but if you wanted to make a statement about it somewhere, um, maybe in terms of building a model for the law somewhere else, then there's already a URL for that. Um, and that's the power of URLs. Uh, gearbox into reverse. Um, so the gearbox isn't going to do that. But the opportunities in terms of, once you get to where we have, in terms of analytics, um, understanding the statute book as a system, what we're modifying, where and why, is legislation wearing out in some areas more quickly than others? in order to be able to see the whole system um, and start to work with it more effectively um, and potentially understand where legislation is working very well and how you might abstract that, the potential is enormous. And we now have the world's best database for EU legislation um, <laughs> uh, and some of the best analytical tools. Um, so um, I'd say let's just knock ourselves out. <laughs> John, thank you very much indeed.